Dear listeners, welcome to another edition of the podcast. In this episode, we virtually travel to Durham, North Carolina, in the United States, to talk to Grandmaster Elshan Moradi Abadi. Elshan is a Grandmaster, born 1985 in Tehran, Iran, and one of the top players in Iran between 2003 and 2016. He won the Iranian Championship in 2001 and a number of tournaments in Europe before moving to the US in 2012. He has co-written two chess books and he is an experienced chess teacher. My name is Erik van Reem. Enjoy this episode number 25 of Let's Talk About Chess. Welcome listeners. In this episode of Let's Talk About Chess, my guest is Grandmaster Elshan Moradi Abadi, born in Tehran, Israel, uh, Iran, and a naturalized citizen of the United States. He's a chess player, he's a coach, he's a book author, and a commentator. So there's a lot, of to- lot to talk about today. So let's talk about chess with Elshan Moradi Abadi. Welcome. Hi. Uh, hi, Eric. It's uh, nice to be here. I would like to uh, say hello to you and everyone who is listening to this uh, podcast and uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to talk about some interesting things with you. Yeah, okay. hope so too. I, I, uh, first of all, I saw a lot of pictures with, of you with wearing a hat. Is that, uh, is that, uh, why is that actually? Is that, uh, oh, well, a th- I see, as I said, uh, when I prepared this, uh, the podcast, I saw, look at some pictures. Uh, he's always wearing a hat, also during play. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like old old school uh, way of wearing hats, and uh, I, I like hats. And uh, um, I used to be more, I used to be very much into classical outfits, but now I'm more casual. But still, I wear the hat. And uh, um, yeah, I think it looks good on me. Uh, some people may, may say not, but I just feel good about wearing it. But I don't wear it as much nowadays because um, in the tournaments, at least in the US, somehow. Uh, the 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 room's temperature, the tournament the tournament hall's temperature goes up. So uh, I started feeling that I, my head is getting heated up, and I cannot think properly. So I just end up not wearing it as I am playing, and sometimes I just leave it there when, I, when the game is over. So I just entirely not wearing it at all when I go to a tournament. But from time to time, I still wear it when I go to a tournament hall that is kind of big enough, and you know there's enough space, and the, the air conditioning is working just fine. Then I'll wear a hat as well. Uh, it's old habits don't die. Old, 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 okay, old school. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering because you don't see that too often that people are wearing hat also during play. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it looks good, of course. Now we're one year in the pandemic already. When, when did you play your last over the board tournament? My last over the board tournament was an unrated tournament here in the US. It was called the Big Enchilada. Uh, and I played it in uh, it's a local tournament like I was top seed and uh, we had another IM, one IM one field uh, and Sabina played us in it as well so it's going to be like four title players and there was like a bunch of young kids playing in it and I won comfortably like four and a half out of five um, and that was April, uh, mid-April because it was on Valentine's weekend so I exactly remember what it was so uh, it was Valentine weekend, April 2020. That was the last time I played over the board. Okay. You also you played last time you played in Europe was the Rilton Cup in Stockholm. Is that right? Yes, or? that was the last time I played in, in, in an over the board uh, tournament in Rilton Cup in Stockholm. Yeah, that was a great okay. experience because yeah, I, you, I, you won it seven out of nine, and it was quite an uh, well exciting tournament for you, wasn't it? It was very exciting because I, I, if you read the r- report on chess space, you see that it was the time that uh, I was going to go to Iran, and then there was a problem with the, you know, there was so many things happening, and the, and the, and the airplane sh- shut down, and the, you know all the things happening with the uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, being killed and everything. So, anyways, so much going on, and I was worried about my family. So, winning a tournament while stressing all day long for it, for the, uh, for that that's. Uh, I, I feel that I tell myself that I show some character winning the tournament. So more than the quality of the games, I felt that I was proud that I could show character sitting at the game, not thinking, filtering out all the problems and playing the game. So yeah, that was a feeling. That was a good feeling. Okay, is that something that you can learn? Something that you only can concentrate on the game and try to uh, 
as I said, if you have a lot of distractions, like like what you said, something a lot of stuff going on, of course, uh, during those tournaments. Um, is it something you you learn in the U.S., for example? Uh, well, you learn it here. People are very practical, and I learned that to some extent. Well, as for me, as it goes for me, everybody finds his own way to filter things out. Um, but here I learned that uh, focusing on the job is a very important thing. This is one thing that your job is the most important thing at the time you are doing it. And it represents you as a person. Mm -hmm. And that's something, you know, when you live in Iran, they don't have that because the job in itself is not important, but it's the outcome. But the job in itself has a value here, which I, which I appreciate. People say uh, Americans are very... Um, People in the United States are very workaholic. Everybody is career oriented and job oriented and thinking about how can they add to their wealth. But in reality, when you think about it, the way at least I've seen in the past nine years is that doing your job and having the quality, it represents you as a person. It mm -hmm. tells your, it, it represents part of your character. So once you see it that way, you give value to your work. So that's why in the past nine years, although I haven't worked as professional as I used to when I was living in Iran, I had a lot more time and, and I was very focused on my chess. I've had better results in the past nine years. Okay, there are more opportunities. Financially, I can travel more independently, of course, thanks to living here. I mean, I, I earn the money kind of like the Western, a, a person living in the West earning money so I can travel, you know, I have more uh, financial um what's it called, independence compared to when I was living in Iran. But anyways, what, what enabled me is that kind of approach. But apart from that also, people like me born in mid-80s uh, or early 80s in Iran, we were born through the Iran-Iraq war. So we fuel our focus through that, you know, we survived the war. So if we survive a war, we can survive anything. So that's, 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 that comes from a background from living in Iran. I was telling myself, what can be worse than, worse than that? I, well, I was born in a neighborhood in Tehran that if you walk five minutes, there was like a, this empty area. And I asked my dad, I was like, there were like few bombs that the Iraqis dropped on the civilians during the war. And one of them was death. And imagine the guy up there in the airplane, he was probably just emptying it because he wanted to go as fast as possible going back, the, the pilot. So if he had made a decision two seconds later, it could be my neighborhood. Yeah. So yeah, it's really it's, it really gives you the, the, the mindset that, you know what, there's there so many things that is out of your control. So if I'm sitting at the board, the best I can do is to play the best moves I can at, 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 at during the game. So that's where it comes from for me. Like, I mean, I can't, there are so many things I cannot control. Yeah. Do you also tell that to your student because you're also a chess coach and you, you teach your pupils? Do you tell those stories also to, to, to them? I do tell them, but, you know, uh, nowadays kids are born into the, you know, the, the thing life is the land of milk and honey and everything is just so great and beautiful and uh, you cannot just get into that that dark feeling of you know i was born into a war and you know i things uh things i experienced like not having things in iran you know and being i would say banished from so many so many uh possibilities uh but I try to give them a picture that, you know, to appreciate things they've been offered, you know, by their parents, like the private tutoring by a coach on a weekly basis and uh, tell them that what they can do at the time, not to focus on the result, but to make good moves. So I can try to fuel it into that. I uh, try to understand that you have to make good moves and that's your task, not to focus on the result. So I think that's how I use it. Okay. Well, maybe we come back to, to a bit later, perhaps to, to, to training and coaching, of course. What else did you play? Did you play a lot of online uh, tournaments last year? Well, I had to play the U.S. Championship because I qualified in 2019 and I was hoping that I would play over the board. It was very uh, sad that I had to play it online, but uh, uh, St. Lucia's Club is very professional. They, 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 they probed all the possibilities of having the tournament uh, uh, in play in person and uh, in, at St. Louis Chess Club, but I think after taking all the all the uh, precautions into consideration, I think they just decided to have a tournament online. So um, I played that one, which didn't go that well for me uh, because I had not played much of an online chess the entire mm -hmm. year. So I basically didn't play anything from uh, that February over the board until. Uh, when I play a tournament, I play some training games with friends, with some other GMs, GM fellows, mm -hmm. but uh, still friendly games are still friendly. You know, you sit there, play back to back rapid games is a different story. Okay. So yeah, I played that one. Then I played at the end of the year, 
I played two series to series tournaments, uh, which was a uh, U.S. championship qualifier for 2021, uh, which I narrowly missed, but I was very proud that I still managed to, you know, I was the grandpa in the tournament. I'm 36 and I was the oldest player in the tournament by 10 years age distance. So I was like, isn't it, isn't it uh, a bit odd, perhaps, every when you're 36 and you're, and you're the oldest one in the tournament? No, I don't feel old that, like that. You know, I, I I I joke with my students. I feel young, and uh, and when I tell them that, it, it shocks them. You know, I don't know if it's my look or whatever is yeah. that. So uh, n no, it doesn't it doesn't shock me, but it it feels funny because a lot of people think that I just have to stop playing because I have I've I'm an I'm an average GM, maybe above a slightly above average GM, and. Uh, I don't know exactly what what what's the average elo of the of the GMs, so I don't know what I'm twenty five fifty five now, but I think it's probably above average. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just I asking because I, I talked to him in previous podcast with uh, Pentala Hare Krishna. He was he's uh -huh. thirty four, and I met him when he was fourteen, and he debuted in uh, Vikanze. And this year he was the oldest participant in Vikanze, and he uh, he I never realized that he was the oldest one with thirty four well, in the that, tournament. That that sounds very shocking, actually. <laughs> yes. Because I thought, oh yeah, because Wojtaszek is the same age, which is but he's a few months younger. You're right. I thought Wojtaszek was the oldest player. No, no, no. Yes, uh, uh, Penta, Penta, uh, Ari was the oldest one. So that's uh, wow. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't well, like that. Also for, also for me, uh, because as I said, as I, I met him when he was 14. Yeah, when he was came for the first time to well to, to this big tournament, and then 20 years later, he's the oldest one and still interviewing him. That's uh, kind of a shocker. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't think much about it, but it feels good that you know, I was a target. Everybody was. It was obvious that people are coming after me, and I was still scoring points, and I still posted a solid twenty six hundred performance. Not, not just to not mentioning that uh, in my last game I had a mouse slip, which which kind of prevented me from winning. Uh, so uh, I played that tournament, and I played the Wilton Cup qualifier. Uh, let's say the winners tournament, which I lost to Sh uh, Shimanov in uh, Armageddon. Mm -hmm. So that was all the three tournaments I played uh, during the year. Nothing, nothing else. Uh, I played the U.S. Championship qualifiers. There was a few mm -hmm. stages: the U.S. Championship and the uh, Wilton Cup winners, which was that end of the year. That's all the chess I played. Okay. And do you watch a lot of chess? Like there is now uh, the uh, new edition of the uh, Magnus uh, uh, of the Magnus Sorensen started today. We are recording this on uh, Saturday, on the thirteenth, and uh, just started actually today. Do you yeah. watch those tournaments online? Or I not? do not watch them live. I watch the games later. Mm -hmm. Or the highlights or something. For, yeah. for, for the high, for I look, I look go through the games. You know, I'm a professional coach. I look for material. I look for interesting opening novelties. I look yes, for yes. interesting end games. So, and I always like to generate my own content because I feel that uh, yes, I refer my students for homework to go to get this book or that book or something like that. But I also want in the class to for have to have something fresh. So. Uh, nothing that nothing that they would just say. Oh, I've seen this idea before, so they can just solve it with, with the naked eyes without even trying. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that they they they, they are being challenged in the class. So I try to have my own content, especially the stronger students. You need you need your own material to 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 make your to at least make them see things through through your lens. We'll just go back to uh, shortly to the U.S. Championship, which is won by Wesley So, who is uh, now a uh, U.S. citizen. Um, yeah, recently became a U.S. citizen. Became a U.S. citizen, and now uh, there's also I don't know if it's already confirmed, but now Levon Oroni is also coming to the U.S. I don't know if he's going to be a U.S. citizen or not, but uh, it is confirmed. Well, uh, for for playing on the U.S. flag, you need to have. A... As far as I know, for the rules, I mean, you have to contact USCF to 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 check the accounts accurately. But I think you need to have either very long term working visa or you need to have a green card. So I think in his case, it's going to be a green card, meaning that to be a permanent resident. Okay. So you, as but as 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 it goes for citizenship, I don't know, but you need to be a permanent resident. But is it also allowed to play for the US team for an Olympiad? For, for yeah, per, permanent residence is because permanent residence you have all the rights of a US citizen except voting. Basically, okay. do you think? Because like I was thinking about, it, he has played a lot of games for Armenia, of course, where he comes from. And now he starts can't stop playing for the for the US. Um, I but, I don't favor. I, I'm not in favor of that. I think there should be, if you play for a country like football, for example, you can stop playing for another country again. 
Do you think that's okay or not? Because also I can also imagine that younger American players think like, hey, they come with Wesley So and Levan Arroyo, they take our places, more or less. Well, as you can see, I'm an immigrant myself, so I cannot be against an immig immigrant. So mm -hmm. and it's it's no, a no. land of it's and it's a land of uh it's a land for people who have had troubles in the past. Like I left because of that. I think Domingo is obviously so I can see and okay, they, these are the top tier players, but they're also middle level mid level GMs like me who come because of for set for for their own reasons. So, and if you do it right here, you can make 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 your way through. In, in, in a certain way. So the way I see it is that the U.S. just will, will benefit from, from Aronian's presence. Now, playing on the national team is another, another question. It's a matter of um, uh, we want people we have produced through our chess culture to represent our, our, our country or not. Uh, personally, I, can, I have a conflicting feeling, feeling about it. Uh, on one hand, it's great to have him to play. Absolutely but, true. Uh, but as you said, he played for Armenia and won the Olympiad with them for so many, uh, so many years, and, and he won the Olympiad three times already. Mm. Um, so it's very hard to comment on that. And uh, but also playing in the Olympiad for younger players is not as big of a thing than you know playing in tournaments and getting the rating up and being able to play in the individual tournaments. So. I don't exactly know how to comment on that, but I understand that, that somebody would argue, well, if all the attentions go, uh, attentions would go to to Levon, then uh, then uh, obviously money and attention would go away from some young players because you know some of the money will stay the same. But now we have a we have a giant sitting up there, so I am I am in favor of producing good players, of course, all the time, and you know having our own players uh, from. From I mean, who go through the scholastic programs and you know the Chester schools and so on, and coach work, working with the coach and you know uh, they have done that. But also, it's it's a good thing to have him. I cannot I cannot I cannot deny that. So you can um, also imagine him uh, teaching you know, young uh, young prodigies, for example. Is that right that he can? Uh, that, I can imagine that. I mean, I'm sure they will ask him to do that. Yeah, Those sure. who are uh, who are sponsoring this, I'm sure they will ask him to do that. So I see the benefit, but also in the short term, it will take away some opportunities from younger players. It's the trade-off. It's hard to weigh. Yeah. It's hard to weigh, and uh, um, I can maybe, understand. Yeah, you know, I, maybe maybe you should maybe you should say that uh, he cannot play for the next say two years or something, and then he can start playing for for a U.S. team, for example. So not immediately, like, like next year or something in an Olympiad, if he comes to the US. I mean, it's well, there are some different possibilities. It's just one Olympiad and one spot is not a big deal. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's it's very hard. It's very hard to assess and uh, and you know, Olympiad. I think from what I see, it's very important to everyone in the US, but it's not as important as it is for like other other countries than it is in the US. So I mean, it represents. Yeah. The chess community, but not that's just something that everybody is following like every day. Like once it's happening, is it important for uh, the Olympiad in Iran, for example? Oh, it's the biggest thing. I mean, everybody is trying to still make it to the team, although you don't get paid for it. But it's it's a big thing to to make it to the team. So it's just still, I think everybody wants to play in the Olympiad. But but again, the possibilities are not so are scarce. So playing a free tournament and play like 11 GMs is not something that happens to you every every day. Now Iran has a strong team, relatively strong team with an all GM team. So uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, playing for, for the national team is, is big is still in Iran, I think. Okay. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a big thing here too, but it's just not, it's not as much followed as, you know, as other places probably. So maybe... What, what, what was actually your reason to come to the US? Was it chess wise because you had the feeling that you couldn't improve in, uh, in in Iran, or what was the what was your reason to come to the US? Well, I was I couldn't improve in Iran. I was stagnating for a long time actually there, and uh, uh, this may cause a bit of a controversy, but you know it will add you maybe to, to your listeners. But I wasn't really on a good term with with a lot of people in there because I was just trying to be. Uh, open about things and I was saying things in a not rude but blunt way mm -hmm. and uh, that didn't buy me so many friends so I couldn't team up with people working on chess and the concerns were always like what can we do next to kind of elevate ourselves as as 
business people in chess than more about we get better players. But when I left, I was like telling myself that I will quit chess. That was my plan. So I came to the US. Well, to quit chess for a while, not entirely. So I wanted to be an academic, which I'm not cut for now, I know. And uh, and I was hoping to get a PhD, being a professor. And in summer times when I have free time, I could play, I could travel and play chess. Like, for example, I like to play in Diren, the, the Dutch Open. Yeah. It's one of my favorite tournaments. I like to play in Flissingen and I liked other tournaments. Like there's there are a couple in, in France and uh, and uh, I like to I like Portugal. So I like to play in Portugal. They have one big tournament there. So I, I was thinking that I can play like in few few countries that I like to play, travel summertime, and then I have my year long job so I can enjoy chess and you know I can have both. But my main job was that my main thought was that I don't want to leave off chess. Okay. But well, then things happened. I wasn't cut for academia. I was a PhD candidate, but I was, yeah, didn't go through. Okay, things also happened uh, in, in 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 our life. Uh, uh, as you know, in seventeen, Sabina's mom passed away, mm-hmm. and uh, we had to move from here because it's hard when you are somewhere and you experience something bad. You want just to ch- change the scenery at least. And then she won the U.S. Championship, so. I had to support her, and she was on the rise in her career at the time. Yeah. So uh, just for the for the, for the listeners, perhaps who cannot uh, uh, combine this, I talked to Sabina Foyshore, um my partner. Yep. Yeah. Your partner uh, in uh, episode number ten, and then she where she talked a lot about uh, about her career and about also about her mother, of course. So yep. if you would like to listen to that, go to episode number ten if you want to listen to Sabina. Yeah. So. Um, story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Uh, um yeah i wasn't cut for that so 17 i was back to chess you know we are moving from from lubbock texas and uh um i had a pleasant experience on the chess team because i was on a chess scholarship and uh, i was coached by grandmaster onishop uh with the team we won the uh, pan americans 2015 mm-hmm. as well so it was a pleasant experience chess wise and i managed to break 2600 finally when i was there uh, which I was always stuck between 25, 50, 25, 80, but finally I just made the final push to, to get to 2600 for myself. Um, so, but yeah, the academic part didn't go through. So I, I just had to pick up the first thing available, although I have like three degrees, <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't thought about using them until now. So I just feel now I just want to go back and use my business degrees. Okay, but did you have a different, as, 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 let's say, as a chess player, it's quite a solid status in Iran as a, one of the best players in the country because you won the Iranian uh, championship, for example? I only once, actually, funny enough, um, when I was 15, and that was the only time I took it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, um, or it's, or, I, or as a, I wanted, wanted to say, how is chess? Um, uh, is, I, when you are a grandmaster, you became a grandmaster, you won the championship. Yeah. How's the status? How was your status there in, in your Well, own? socially high, you know. For example, you go to a place and they invite you as one of the high high achievers in your, for example, university. And you go to a ceremony and there are like 5,000 people and they give you a standing ovation. So that's just boost your ego. That mm-hmm. feels good. But I'm not a, I'm not very much into that, you know. You go to places, you give a talk and there are like hundreds of people and they want your signature and you sound like, you feel like a celebrity in, in your country. But, and, and it's nice and people are genuine about caring about you, but then you have to struggle and go to Minister of Sport and talk to someone who doesn't know much about chess and ask for funding and sponsorship to go to some tournaments and, you know, explain and reason that I need to play in tournaments if I want to represent the country. You know, I just cannot sit at home and work on chess without playing to, in the tournament. And that costs money. And, you know, the kind of money we make in the tournaments is not enough to support in, inside the country, in Iran, is not enough to support us to go to these tournaments in, like in Europe or some other like, local. I mean, the ones in the Persian Gulf area and um, like in Emirates and other ones, okay, maybe I could afford those, but traveling to Europe is costly. Uh, so, and then I have to go and reason that and see this guy and that guy and befriend this. And that takes a long time. And then I had to go through the process of getting a visa and the kind of humiliation they had over Iranians with the European countries. I'm sorry, it may sound bad to you, but they really hum- humiliate you in the, in, the, in the embassies. And that's not just nice. Mm-hmm. I could feel that they, they don't treat me correctly. Like I'm there, like this, this, they see you like, oh, you're trying to get a visa and go ask for asylum. And that's how they treat you. And that's just not nice. You stand oh, in line. You stand in the line for many hours. You have all documents. I'm a grandmaster, and they treat you like that. And that wasn't just nice. No, no, I can understand so, that. Yeah, 
how how it, how that must have felt how you must have felt felt then uh, at the time then getting a visa trying to get a visa and uh, you're not treated like you, a you, you go five in the morning standing in the line for two hundred uh, uh, for for two hundred other people uh, and you get in at twelve uh, at noon seven hours you're waiting to get to get in the line to get your turn and then they ask you questions like if you are trying to just take advantage of your visa and it's just like I mean are you serious yeah. They talk down to you, and then, anyways, I'm sorry for our European listeners, but that's how they treat you in the embassies in Iran. Uh, um, uh, and I understand some of it. Some people may have done that, but you know, you don't presume that everybody is like that. You just try to be cautious. Um, um, and and one reason, I'm sorry again, I don't want to make a comparison here and make any political statement. But when I went to the uh, U.S embassy there was one thing i didn't have and the lady sitting there oh you can go do this and come back and explain these things and she told me what to do uh and that was just nice and kind and i for the very first time i felt welcome that was the first and last time i went to an embassy your u.s embassy and i was like oh i just felt warm inside and everything just went through just the day i was landing i was like oh, okay i'm starting off something good okay but anyways uh-huh. And how was it in the US? How were you uh, welcomed there? Did you, did you feel at home? Or what, well, not at home, perhaps. But did you feel did you feel good to being in the US? Well, as you can see, the political uh, environment now is ex- extremely bimodal right now. So they're they're both ends. So I see both ways. But you know, it's big enough that you can find your niche place and be with the people you you care for and be in a community that you know you understand that you you have the affinity and the closeness that you can you, you both share the same values sh- sh- same opinion uh, the thoughts you have it, it works for me mm-hmm. and I, again nothing against europe I'm, i have so many friends in europe okay i'm sorry i don't want to sound like that what i'm saying is that moving to the u.s as you said about because i don't want to be t- too much apart from too much go away deviate from your question your question was that being in iran as a professional and being solid yes it was solid but i had all these problems traveling visa uh ex- expenses uh working on it and you know months go after the uh, visa the the worry about if the visa will be issued right right on time then i had to find someone who would book for me right now i can just go online and book for my for my trip but right now there I, somebody had to book my ticket somebody had to book my hotel room so it wasn't comfortable it wasn't comfortable so um yes it feeds your ego being a chess player in iran because you're a celebrity but i don't enjoy being a celebrity i enjoy being myself and having freedom yeah we don't want to be too political here in this podcast for example right now but I have to ask you, in the, in the 80s, you were born in 1985, that was in the middle of a period in which the chess was banned in uh, Iran. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. That's right. Okay, you didn't notice it, but in 1985, when you were born, of course, but you learned chess then uh, in the early 90s, I think. Yes. Uh, how was it? Was there uh, material, books, chess magazines, for example, in, in Iran, where you could yeah. learn, learn chess? It was a, it was a, it was arid. It was like empty, nothing at first. There were books that was translated a long time ago. So I, I found a very used, almost oil, I had to say greasy, with greasy papers version of the Miserlis book, which is called what? Uh, Miserlis. It's uh, I forgot what's the book called in English. Um, they, they, they published it. The, the uh, Quality Chess publishes it. They, they have it. So I I had a, this used version that I, I, I read from um, cover to cover. Then there was this Switin's book about, uh, um, again, the art of chess, something like that. But it was translated in, in Farsi such that it would make sense to you. So the name, the, 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 uh, the title doesn't represent, is not the English one probably. So another Switin's book I have read. And then... There was also a book translated into Farsi, I think, Think Like a Grandmaster from Kot- by Kotov. It was one of the few books that was yeah. translated in uh, Farsi, I, I right? Read, I, I read that first 40 pages and I was like, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of people say that, actually. Yeah. I yeah. was like, I, do I have enough time to think like that? I don't think I have that much time to think like that. <laughs> and it sounds like a more... And uh, But I was lucky that the people uh, from the... From the um, 
who were who are young in their 70s and now after 90 they were like middle aged people and they're past their prime so they were not, they could not be already they're like 2200 2300 players they started teaching chess so that was the lucky part so i could get training not the best optimal one but these guys because they were studying chess that so they would come and show me games classics of capablanca but vinic this and that so we were going with a very old school way of doing chess so but the good thing is that i learned all the classics okay because we were behind in material i ended up reading a lot of old, old school chess the you know combination uh, the combinations the way of the way you would see tactics you know what's what was the hyper modern everything so i went through a very uh, basic but classical training because that was the only material available in iran okay. like if you would ask me in 1990s when i was starting chess who were like a strong player in 1990s that you can name and weren't one of the top players. Like I, I learned about Liu Bojevic when I was like 14 already. And I was like 2200. I was like, wait, wait a second. This guy is very strong actually. Like Anderson, I was, I started looking at this game when I was 15. I was behind. When when we had the Soviet coach coming to Iran, Sarhan Guliev, to whom I owed the title of being a GM, uh, he was he was hired by the Federation. And that was the breakthrough for me. Then I was like, oh, wait a second. There are all these players from 80s which and 90s, which I haven't heard of. And you, and you learned that later or something? Or did you learn it uh, in so the, the US? Breakthrough... Or when you came to the US to learn no, 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 all no, no, those, of course those not. Or... No, I came to the US 12, 2012. I'm yeah, talking that's right. 2012. Yeah, well, 19... We have to go 10, 10 years back. Yeah, no, we, go, we will go back 13 years back. Nine, I'm talking 1997 when I, I went to my okay, first sure. tournament. When I went to my first tournament as in the world, in the world uh, youth. And then I had my first chess base and then I had my first database and I looked at these games and I was looking at the games of Larsen and then Ljubojevic and then um, Anderson oh my god I fell in love with Anderson's games right right, right off the bat and because uh, I was only I looked at the games of the world champions and their opponents in the finals basically so the only other not world champion I knew was was Korchnoi and did you did you know how those players looked like? Because I, I, I talked to Ian Rogers, Grandmaster Ian Rogers, uh, also recently here on the podcast, and he came in 1976, 76, I think, to the to uh, like I can say to the Netherlands to a tournament, and he had no clue how those people looked like, like Kotsnoy, for example, and all, all the other big names like Max Oewe, uh, the former uh, FIDE world champion. He had no idea, and this gentleman was always watching his games and until and he was told later afterwards that uh, did you know that the, the former world champion was looking at your games and he had no idea the so things started changing from 90 uh, 95 96 because federation started spending money on the young players so the first time iran sent a player sent players to world youth was 1996 and uh, 97 when i went there well in the federation we had the photos from the past of these top players mm -hmm. Uh, for example, there was a photo on the wall, and I couldn't tell who this guy is. But then later I figured out it was Reti. So there was there are photos of them there. There was there existed a culture. I'm not saying they didn't, but until you were willing to do your own research and like asking, like I was in a federation, and there were all these photos up there. I was like, who is this guy? This is Reti. This one is Nimzovich. This one is. So I got to see there were photos of them on the wall. Like these are the famous like the the legends, the legends there. So there were books translated. There was another book I read, Rinfeld's book on, on the greatest chess. Was it Rinfeld or Chernev? Uh, the greatest players of all time, the legends or something like that. Mm. Something like that one. So yeah, it was very, there were material there, but it was very scattered. Mm. So you had to do your own research to put the, to put, to connect the dots. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah it's cool to see. And that's uh, how you get a very good, Classical, classical, uh, and basics. You learn the basics, then, right? I just re read a, a quote here by Magnus Carlsen. He said in an interview last week, he said, "I do feel that some of the youngst youngsters today are not so good at the basics. I don't think you can develop a broad enough understanding of the game to the best by only training with the computer." What do you say about uh, that? I 100 percent agree, and I think the main advantage Magnus has over his rivals is not his calculation, is not his openings, is that his understanding of that and the fact that the moment he needs to play faster and make practical decisions, he can go, that kind of knowledge kick in very fast and he can make very good decisions with good heuristics. I don't think still any of these young, I mean, even some of them in some points like MVL or or or, or um, Firuzja or for example, even sometimes Wesley or even 
even Fabiano, of course, of, uh, have better calculation than Magnus in times. Mm -hmm. But uh, when that heuristic decision making kicks in, still Magnus stands out substantially. And I think that's because maybe he, he spent more time on it. I think now they do. I think others are. But I remember once I was listening to uh, Wesley and I love his position on chess. Like I always I read, I watch all of his games. Um, he called, uh, he called uh, the Ruskis Endgame Manual as classical. And, and that was funny for me because my, the Ruskis Endgame Manual was a new book at the time when I started looking at things. Classical to me was names of which my system or, uh, or Uwe uh, mastering, I don't know if, if I'm calling the game. He, he has a couple of books, Uwe. Uh, a lot he, of books, a lot of books, yeah, a lot of books. No, also no, about no, the no, the end game one, yes, but the middle game one, there's a, there are two books that are connected. Like there's a, there's a first volume and a second volume. There was one, I'm, I could be wrong because it was maybe translated in Farsi that way. So like th those are classical to me, you know? So when he called, when he called uh, the Ruskis Endgame Manual classical, that was like, oh, wow. We are far, far apart in the way we see, we see the classical and we see things, but I mean, he's a natural talent. So it, it, it works for him like that. But for me, like, Classical in the end game is going to be Aberbach or or uh, or Keres, but not not Devorisk. Devorisk is not definitely classical. It's a it's a classic in the sense that uh, it's a classical. Sorry, it's not a classic. It's a classical in the sense that it teaches you the basics of of end games. But I will not put him or 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 Karsten Muller as classical. You know, end game books. Classic yeah. end game books. Sorry, classic. Yeah. They're classical, but they're not classic. Yeah, okay. I can understand what you mean, of course. Yeah, that's it's uh, books are still very important, right? And learning the learning the classics in a classical way. That's, yes. Uh, that's. Is, are you also still using books? You're writing books yourself, of course, and uh, compiling material yourself, right? As you said earlier. Yeah. How how important is it? and where where is it, where do you get the material from? You said you're watching tournaments and making unique material for your students yeah well i go um i mean i use chess base sometimes and I narrow down my search and i have positions for example sometimes i search look i know for example there is this game of, of one of my favorite games that uh, yasser won against uh, sasanko in a in a tournament i won't mention it because i don't want to give free material to people <laughs> but anyways <laughs> but uh there's this very i love this game that i i would say he uses a quasi uh out uh uh, outpost and I teach it to my student and uh, I just search same maneuver that that Yasser did in that game mm -hmm. and uh, then I see some some of the games are re relevant some of them are relevant so I just add games and go back and forth I don't care about the ratings or as long as it represents what I want to do and what I want to show to my students I will I'll add it to my content mm -hmm. and also I'll check with the engine if there is no tactical blunders or for example, if there is a move that would make it 2.5 and the, the move they made is like 2.2, yeah, that's fine. That's still winning. So what I care is that if it explains the idea without making any blunder, and that's mm -hmm. how that's how I do my research. Okay. And uh, what 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 do you, do you have a lot of students? And did, and did you start working as a chess coach uh, immediately after you went uh, arrived in the US? You became a chess a FIDE, FIDE uh, coach 2011, right? Already. Yes. So and then, and then you went to the US and did you start? Uh, well, did uh, you start? Want... Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so uh, you want me to tell all the stories, uh, like from how I did coaching, or you want me to story how I started in the US? We can, you can start in the how you did. Did you already uh, start, start in Iran already as a teacher? So I started in Iran. Yeah, actually, I coached uh, Dorsa, Darashani, and Sarah Khadam. They were like my students, and they they got reasonably they improved. Dorsa was seventeen hundred when it started with me. When I left Iran, she was twenty one hundred. Sarah started with me when she was twenty sixty six. I cannot remember that number for some reason. And uh, when I left, she was twenty three hundred. Um, so I was working with them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I had on enough students here and there. Some people would come take some training with with uh, from me uh, for tournaments. Like I coached Puya Idani for one tournament, I think, um, but not nothing like long term. Long term was Sara and Dorsa basically at the time. Then twelve, when I moved again, it was on and off. Some people wanted to learn some openings, some lines, some lectures here and there, but that was about it. I wasn't a professional coach. But then uh, seventeen, I was back 
to do full-time coaching again. But I was doing coaching and writing in the in, in that period. And um, did you notice in last year did you get did you get more more students uh, because of the pandemic and also because of the Queen's Gambit? I would I wouldn't say more. It's it's about the same, but it's more consistent. I would say mm -hmm. it's more consistent. Uh, Yeah, I think oh, I think I was I wouldn't say I'm I, I'm fully established or I'm not or I'm worried about not having enough students. I'm some kind of in the middle, not fully established, but not also concerned about not having enough students. Mm -hmm. So I would say I'm somewhere that, somewhere there. Okay. Does it? Uh, how, how often do you do that per in a week? Or? Okay, I do many hours. Yeah, many hours. Yeah. <laughs> I have okay. I, I do I I I'm a full time coach basically. It's like a job because okay. I have to prepare for the classes and. Sure, uh, sure do things and I'm, I'm a full-time coach. So that's why it felt good when I mentioned I did well in the online qualifier because I'm a full-time coach and I took like three days off before the tournament, reviewed my openings and uh, brushed up and did some tactics and I did okay in the tournament. So I was like, okay, I still can play. Okay. Do you also use your own uh, books in when you're uh, teaching? Because you wrote two, uh, two, two books as far as I know, right? I co-authored two books, yes. I co-authored co one with Al Lawrence and that's for the more... Uh, I, I usually tell my working professionals who are like in 1500 level to read that book, uh, that one, 1400 or 1600 level players. Yeah, the one a, other... the, yeah, sorry, the title is Chess and, Art of, Chess and the Art of War, Ancient Wisdom to Make You a Better Player, right? Yes, that's the one. with L, L. Lawrence, right? Yes, mm -hmm. that's the one I would recommend them between even beginners. So sometimes I even have people who are really beginners and I don't take them usually as, as a student. So I tell them to get the step books. Uh, the uh, I don't know how, is that how they refer to them step books. Yeah, the, I know what you mean. This is from the Dutch. Uh, yes. Score van Weigeren, yeah, the stop yes. and method. They call it the steps method. The yes, steps method. Yeah. So yeah. I tell them one and two. I do not f f uh, follow exactly their order after book three, but I tell people who are beginners to go one, two, three for sure. I really like the first three books. Okay. Uh, Yeah, and the, and the other book that came out that was published recently, you wrote together with your partner, with uh, Sabina. Yes. It's called Sherlock's Method, the working tool for the club player. Yeah, that's, that's for my more younger uh, students who have more time. And uh, I, I said 1,700 to 2,300 in the book. Yeah, uh, and I quite, tell a rate, people, quite a wide range, 1,700 to 2,300. Yeah, the, the thing is that the chapter three, if you are not above 2,200, it's really probably hard to, for you to yeah. answer So chapter three, my student who is like almost 2,200 and he's been working with me for seven years, he barely scores 50%. And he's really good. I mean, he's underrated. And he's still, so if you're not 2,200 above, uh, you cannot really go to, through chapter three. And if you're not solid 18, 1,900 player, you will have problem in chapter two. But chapter one, if you go through and it's, it's there are hard ones in it too, but you can It's manageable for people from 1700 to 2300. I mean, to 2200 easily. Yeah, it's quite a quite a book. I have it right here at the moment. It, it's uh, how many pages again? 450 almost. Yes. Lo yeah, 430 something. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, exercises, of course, in the book, and a lot of explanation. Must have cost quite a lot of time to to gain all this material, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it took us it took us about uh, a year. I, I'm really thankful here to Sabina because she kept me on, on track because I'm a perfectionist when it comes to writing. Mm -hmm. And I, li I like to go over and see my material. I look at it with three different engines and uh, and Sabina was on board with the idea, but she's also more practical that it sh you should get the book out there for the students and you have to focus on the students. You have to focus on who is going to read it. Not that what you think is the best material that represents them, but you have to get it there and uh, put it there If it's not in the next book, you can get the feedbacks and do better in the next book. But you first have to not just to do a sloppy job, but you know, you have to focus on what is best for students there. And uh, like our students have this kind of and this kind of weaknesses, and this is the kind of weak feedback we get. So we focus on finding positions like that. But I triangulate three different engines, go back and forth. I want to make sure that this is so. Uh, really, she did a good job on keeping me on track. But it took me a year to collect the collect the material. But it took us one one month to compile it but it took us one year we go back and forth discuss this position does it fit this here or not we knew we were going to do a three chapters book as it is three parts books but 
uh, the story and uh, the uh, lectures are written in, in a one, one month time. And the Sherlock story? Did you write the story? Yeah, the, I did. Sherlock story, I, yeah. The story, yes. The, the, the material was with me and Sabina. I wrote the story, yes. I wrote the story. And how did you get the idea to put it in in this this format? To have this as a story, as a Sherlock story? Yeah, I learned I learned English basically by watching Sherlock Holmes uh, t uh, series, but uh, um, the one with Jeremy Brett by, by, by BBC. I don't know if you've watched that one or not. That's a classic one. Mm -hmm. And my favorite is The Hound of Baskerville. I used to remember quotes of it. I mean, uh, that's not quotes, parts of it. I could just read through it. I and mean, if you would ask me like three years ago, so I always watch it several times. Um, so yeah, I I'm I'm a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, and uh, like I went to London three days. That's the only time I spent in London. And one of the things I did, I went to the two two one Baker Street. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. That's, uh... I'm a well, fanatic. Yeah, it's good. Good form. Then, did did you get any feedback from 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 players and from from others uh, on the book? If they, do, do they like it or whoever has bought it? As we know they they mm -hmm. liked it. Of course, people who are writing reviews, uh, they have their own opinions. I only have seen the positive one, maybe because that's what they share with me. If there are negative ones, I would love to read and learn about it. Well, obviously, I also. I have it. How to say? I, I have my own way of looking at the criticism. So if it's something, oh wait a second. If I say, oh wow, I didn't see it from this angle. I'll, I'll take it and I'll try to come, uh, come, come. How to say? Take it, process it, and then in the future when I write, I will, I will take it into consideration. If I say it's just uh, someone who's trying to tra tra trash my work, I will not take it into consideration. So people can have opinions. I cannot control people's opinion. Sure, but sure. Uh, if I see, oh wow, wait a second, I missed this thing. Yeah, they're right. I, I'm open. But if I just see, okay, it's, this is just this is bad without giving a reason, then I just don't care about it. Mm -hmm. So I have had one good comment, uh, I'd say criticism, I would call, or uh, that I, I can improve upon in future, uh, which I have taken into consideration that one. But apart from that, there is were kind of good reviews so far. Okay, that's good. Does it also motivate you to make uh, another book, for example? Is there something planned or do you have any uh, ideas? I, I love writing, but you know, it's also, it's really time consuming mm -hmm. and I've got other things going on right now. So I don't think it will happen like in the next couple of months or three months, but eventually it, along the way, um, that was another plan I had to go to academia so I can write my chess books too, as I am in academia. But um, so far there have been two co-authoring. So we'll see if I'll find my time to write a chess book but also writing chess books these days you have to give more moves and explanations than than just words you know all book, old school books when you read them and they are fantastic writers all of them the ones who are writing books in 50s 60s and 70s but i want to i want to ask my students read them and it just doesn't make sense to them they just run the engine i was like but this move they're suggesting is just wrong and i have to explain that to them and so conceptual writing is very hard these days in chess i don't know how you can write conceptual books these days it's very hard do you have any favorites uh, or could you recommend some of these books you just mentioned from the 50s, 60s or something? Chess books and what's, what, what, what would I mean, you I like Aber, Aberbach, uh, uh, Smith of Levenfish Endgame book is fantastic for me. Mm -hmm. That's that's just Aberbach's Endgame books are great. Um, tournament books are, of course, they're always great to read them. Um, but that's about it. I don't think those conceptual books, self-improvement ones are easy to suggest because um there 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 are, there are good collections there there are good positions there but the way they are explaining the ideas because there is there was no engine there was no detailed tactical or combinatorial uh, analysis of it and uh basically the, 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 the timing factor has been taken out of these conceptual books because you want to say, i want to realize this plan but you don't have the time to do that nowadays we know because you have to do the calculation, get more into the details. There's there are more dynamics involved, so it makes it makes it hard to suggest. But they are all they all have great collections of positions. Yeah, as you said, chess is changing. I think uh, also the time controls are getting faster and faster. I think. Uh, yeah. Especially online, of course. Do you think that has a lot of influence on chess and also on, on top players like Magnus Carlsen and uh, 
and, and all the others. Well, uh, over the board chess is still the same. When I looked at the uh, uh, Y and Z, uh, it was only the players were, were rusty because they haven't played over the board for a long time, but the kind of chess and the openings they were playing is what one expects to see. There, there's a little bit of taking risk here and there by younger players, which is understandable. They want to prove themselves. For example, Fan Fardis played the, this risky line in, in Roy Lopez in Spanish against Tari because mm-hmm. he probably was trying to win the game and you know join the leaders. So, yeah, that's understandable. But apart from that, the openings were kind of expected. I mean, like it, the way it used to be before the pandemic. But oh, online chess, you know, there's no rating involved. You don't, you, you don't lose your uh, status as a player. You don't worry about your rating. So it can become more fun. Yeah, that's it, yeah, a lot of people love it. Eh? I like watching online chess and uh, a lot of uh, spectators, of course. Do you have you planned yourself to do a Twitch channel, for example, as a teacher, chess teacher, I, or YouTube had- or something like that? Maybe YouTube because I had a Twitch plan, uh, Twitch, but you know when I sit there and start talking and it bores you after a while because if people are not taking part in the conversation, you just feel that I'm just I'm doing a monologue of my own. I'm not a very good person to do monologue. I already go a, a very lengthy way to just go beyond your question, right? I just answer, give you very long answers. So uh, when I just do that and just keep talking, I just feel that I get I shift the way I, I move away from my initial goal of what I'm doing. So uh, probably Twitch not, but uh, YouTube is because you can control the time. I talk 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever. But I just say, I'm making this video for 20 minutes. So you can make a plan. You go from A to Z and there where I end. So that's easier. But Twitch, you kind of have to keep it entertaining, but go back and forth. You don't know when you want to end. You feel like, oh, it's the time to end or not. You cannot end in 20 minutes. People will be disappointed. So not Twitch, but maybe YouTube. Okay. Because of the, the the entertainment factor in chess, is it becoming more and more um, important? Do you think so? When I look at some Twitch channels and uh, when I hear already they're playing music, when they're analyzing and stuff and playing, I personally don't like it. But maybe I'm too old for that. I'm uh, in my mid 50s and 53. And when I switch on a switch a Twitch channel and I hear music and I switch it off already because I don't like it. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. But- I, 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 I'm I, nothing against it. Obviously, we want more people involved in chess. That's what yeah, we that's want. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh, we want to in, in, increase, uh, we want to improve the base and we want more people. So I have nothing against it, but it's not for me. No, no, it's not for me as well. I like to watch, uh, like, for example, this commentary of this tournament, which is going on with uh, Jan Gustafsson and Kazem Jana, for example. And they're just quietly analyzing the position without some fancy stuff and just playing the games. Yeah. And, uh, Maybe that's more for me, but it is good that there is enough um, material for all kinds of people, yeah, for younger people, for older people, for example. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I just worry that it, it, it may start representing chess, which I'm worried about. For example, you know, they may, for the fun part, they play some unsound openings and they just, you know, because someone is a very strong player or not, or just it may work in one thing. And then people think that, oh, okay, they can try and dabble with things. And that can have bad impact on the students. But I explain, at least for my students, it hasn't had. So you can explain to them and they can understand that. Just I hope it will not make things such that, oh, it's the new norm for, for chess. We want chess to be like this. That's not the fact. Because a lot of people see it like that. They mm-hmm. come to me and they want lessons. Like, but this class is boring. I was like, it's not entertainment. You're learning chess. You know, that's the entertainment of chess. So people think perhaps that it is very really quite easy to learn chess and to become quite a better, a good player pretty fast. But it, it, you need a lot of, lot of efforts to become a good player, don't you? Yes, yes. And when it's an inter- inter- entertainment, the factor of result is out of it. So you don't think about when the result becomes important, that means you have to be serious. You have to do everything by the book, which means like in any other sport, chess is like a sport, art, slash. So you have to put the effort into it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's great. Uh, we um, talked about a lot of things. We talked about a little bit of a more sensitive topic. Is uh, You gave an interview in November uh, last year, I think, where you said that you urge Iran players to quit the National Federation because there is uh, always this political controversy that players um, from Iran do not play against people from Israel, right? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, we have to explain that the players have no call in that. Yeah. Yeah, it is... Okay, what well, is explained always by the Iranians that the players have can can choose by themselves if they want to play or not. 
Yeah, well, they say they can choose by themselves. But if I know that I that some sort of a persecution and some sort of a pursuit would, would would follow me after, I mean, when I say I as a person or, or as a chess player or any sportsman living or athlete living in Iran, if I'm worried about that and if I'm worried about my family, obviously I, I'm going to just not to play the game, right? And it doesn't worth the worth the hassle. Um, so the the thing is that it's not the player's decision. It's it's obvious first first thing. And Fidi, I understand, you know, it's ethics uh, and uh, any, anyone's ethics would tell you that, any any sensible ethics would tell you that, you know, that game be played between two sportsmen, two athletes, athlete has nothing to do with politics. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows that, you know. Um, but what can you do? You can, you're not going to convince the Iranian, Iranian government about that because, again, I said in my interview, the money for federation or for any sport in Iran comes from the government. Government is the main, is so big in Iran. It's the main sponsor of everything. So you want to go to the tournament, you want to be paid for all, for expenses and, you know, have a salary maybe or something, you need to rely on the government. That Then that means you are accepting this policy that makes it the president of the federation or, or anything else because... There's no independence. So they represent the government's agenda. Thus, it will always be like that as long as the situation between Iran and Israeli, Israeli government is the same. Yeah. So you also by, to, you also by banning the federation, by, I mean, FIDE sure. is trying to ban the Iranian federation. By banning the federation, yes, you are standing by your values. So that's good for FIDE, but it doesn't solve any problem. It just takes out the most the country with the most number of the federated player in the Middle East out of the out of the map. Mm-hmm. So the only way I think is that at least the FIDE can give the right to the players to represent themselves. So leaving the federation is more about players being freely on their FIDE flag or whatever they want to call it, represent themselves regardless of the federation. Mm-hmm. And that's some some fact that the FIDE should recognize at least to realize because if they say they care about sport, then they should care about the players. I don't care about the federation. I don't care about who is the president of the federation. Mm-hmm. It's all politics. I think probably everywhere in the world is the same. It's all politics and really they don't really, <laughs> they're there for the position and not for the, I'm sorry to, to be like, to sound like this, but it's there for, not for serving, but it's there for the title. So, so uh, it's not always everywhere like that, but it's a very predominant fact. We just, just face it. So uh, I don't care about the people at the, at the federation. Mm-hmm. I care about the athletes. Okay, so yeah. the athletes, if I'm going to a tournament, maybe FIDE can give them give them some, they have the right to play in the norm tournaments. They will count as a as a third country or the, or, a, or a new new country so they can add to the norm, they can add themselves to the norm, norm tournaments and they can play the international tournaments uh, freely. Yeah. So yes. will, it be, will it be an extra burden for FIDE? Yes. Will they do that for the players? I don't know. It's not me. I'm not, I'm not the policy maker. But uh, yeah, difficult I mean, topic. Difficult topic. I think uh, Ali Reza Fiorusha, who is yeah, one of the biggest talent perhaps in the world, I think he's playing on the FIDE flag. Do you think that, that that that's good that he's playing on the FIDE flag right now? Well, I mean, he's he's he can play freely without having any problem. Well, Ali Reza Fiorusha must do that because we want maybe he will play. I mean, I would say certainly he will play a match with Magnus Carlsen in the World Championship match in the next five years at least. Uh, uh, so that's something everybody's looking to. So that is basically saving chess world, having saving one of his talent. But Firuzja is just an elite player. I mean, he's one prodigy coming every, I don't know, 15 years nowadays. So, so, uh, so I'm not worried about Firuzja. I mean, he needed to, I mean, chess world should care enough to make sure Adriza Firuzja will play the kind of tournaments and play at that level. But I'm talking about if, and, and I am who's like 25 and he wants to be, become a GM. And uh, there are some of them, there are some young IMs and some other people. These people have the right to play. Yeah, sure. But sure. now they're they are being, but now we're going to ban them just because they are they were born in Iran. That's not just nice. I understand they should play. And if they are willing to play and take the risk on their own playing against Israeli players out of the Iranian Federation, then they can they can go and play in the tournaments. So, again, I would say the risk is so high that a lot of people may not do that, but at least they, are, they should be given the chance to do that. Because if you are going to take it away from the people, then 
then we're not really solving the problem here. We're just eliminating the problem. We just say, oh, we are not looking at this question anymore because we don't, these pillars don't exist anymore. That's what we're doing. Have you ever played with uh, Ali Reza or have you ever met him? Uh, no, I think when I left Iran, I was just a kid. <laughs> he's still very young. Yeah. He's still 17, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When I left Iran, it was like nine years ago. So yeah, it was like eight or nine or something. Yeah. yeah. He's now living in France, I think, with his family. Isn't that, is that right? And uh, I do not know much about. Uh, I mean, I, I follow his game. I, I'm I'm cheering for him, but uh, that's that's uh, that's as much as I know. It's very. Uh, do you like his style? It's quite risky, isn't it? Well, I mean, he's at the age he's trying to get to twenty eight hundred, right? I mean, that's his goal, right? He's twenty seven fifty, so he needs to take some risk. Otherwise top level i mean he cannot just go play games uh, and play and uh, play, play berlin with black and ex expect his rating to go up right yeah i read something interesting in an, in, uh, in in this chess space um, article about this Realton cup that you changed your style a bit from a quite a solid iranian style to a more uh, adventurous style because you've played in a lot of opens in the us Is yeah right? well yes that's right because winner takes it all and uh, I owe it to some extent to Alex Shabalov mm -hmm. because he plays very risky and I was following him in the tournaments and I could say, okay, he doesn't win this, these two tournaments, but he wins the third one and some of the money he wins because of winner takes all in the US, basically the first prize is much bigger, is more than the sum I could win by, by finishing second and third in so many tournaments in a row. So I was like, okay, so I got to go for it. And the tournaments are short, five, six rounds of weekend tournaments. So you have to go from day one, go for it for the kill. So it really affected me in a good way. I was a bit of a timid player. I was trying to make draws between the lower rated players. That was my mentality for a long time. And now it doesn't matter what my opponent's rating is. I just play the game. And whatever happens, happens. Okay. So That's I play sharp principle chess. And I'm enjoying it. And I actually, it represents my personality. I didn't know that. But it just makes me happy. That's what matters. That's, that's what matters. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's been great, really great talking to you tonight it's a lot of insights uh, so and i also learned quite so quite learned quite a lot actually tonight um sure. there's one more question i want to ask you one in one in four months uh, four months uh, four weeks you have the, the last seven rounds of the candidates tournament do you have a favorite what do you think what will happen who will who will challenge magnus Carlsen? Well, well i'm an american i of course i would love to see fabiano winning it but i don't think it's it's a uh, I mean, he is not in a bad shape. He he played very solid in, in Waikanzi, and he had he spoiled many actually good chances there, which, which he could he could even do better than what he did. Um, I th yeah, I think he played the, the best chess in Waikanzi actually. When I look at the games, it's really really yeah. good actually. And he's I also think, not yeah. he's not playing these online tournaments right here right now at the moment. So I think he's very seriously preparing for the uh, candidates. I think. I think Fabiano plays the most entertaining chess in the top level. And he has the best opening preparations uh, when I look at his games. And I really like his chess. It's, 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 it's too deep for me because it's obviously that it's very concrete and exact. When I say too deep is that if I don't sit there and spend hours with the engine, I will not get everything he's playing. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I would like him to win, but I still think seven rounds and being one full point behind, it's, it's a lot of games. But given that Everybody knows he's going to play, and he is like, I don't know how many whites he has actually. I, I haven't checked that one. Can you? I, 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 yeah. I don't know actually, but uh... I think if he has four whites, he's still in the he's still in the batch. If he has four whites, uh, he's still there. Um, I think uh, Nepo has a bit of more chance because um, I think uh, after Envil had had bombed uh, Wykan Z. Uh, his online chess also he seems a little bit unstable so but it's a four weeks it's a long time to kind of get his cool back and you know he's he's in the lead so yeah yes together with the Nepo yeah he has four and a half out of seven I think so and Alex Senko hasn't played anything over the board or anything at all so did he play the Russian championship oh, I don't Senko? know I don't think so and also the uh, the the Chinese players so um, they don't also do not play in the, uh, in the online anything, tournament basically. So. yeah well. and anything so I just wonder what because those guys. I mean, Van Kao is in the in the middle, and then uh, you, um, Ding Liren and uh, Alexeyenko, they're kind of the bottoms. Uh, they're at the bottom of the, the, the table, and uh, these guys will define the tournament. 
because if they have a bad bad shape and in the first few rounds they are playing someone on top and if they just drop they just drop the points because they just haven't had enough training and they just haven't warmed up that can really define because a free point matters a lot you know you get a free win or some some lucky wins and that's that's what matters yeah. so uh i think the first three rounds will tell whoever p- plays against these guys in the lower half of the table and uh, score points uh giri and uh giri and uh, grishuk are solid i don't see them scoring so many points like mm-hmm. that they may start on a plot they may end up in a, on a plus but i don't see them going like plus three in seven games. I don't see their style being like that. They go plus three or plus four in three games. So I don't see them suddenly there on the top. Um, so I think it's Nepo, MVL, and uh, to a little lesser extent, or maybe it's my wishful thinking Fabiano, because he's capable of scoring plus three in seven games if it's going his way. He's yeah. done it before, so he's, I think... He's, yeah, he's done some miraculous... Uh, things like, like, uh, like in St. Yeah. Louis and Liv, I can say also last year that she won with a so yeah Morgan. if he starts if he's he's in he, if he's in the flow he can do it so I think these three guys are the main and whatever they do the first three rounds against the, the, these guys we mentioned the two the two Chinese I mean Wang Hao was doing solid last year I wouldn't say it would be easy but now he hasn't played for a long time so so you don't know what's what's what can be it and Alexienko and uh and Ding that can be the defining and that can be a very defining factor the first three rounds yeah, well, we'll see. We'll uh, start in uh, four weeks, I think, uh, with the rest of the one year after uh, after after the end of the first part of the candidate tournament, which is also quite a bit odd, isn't it, to play one year later? Well, I mean, these days, if you just uh, try to criticize FIDE, you will get more backlash. So I will not just talk about it. <laughs> Very good. What are your plans for this year, the rest of the year? Well, I've been very much stuck here, so I'm very much looking forward to get my vaccine. Mm-hmm. They say I'll, I might have it by the end of May. And I, and I plan to, I am going through actually some non-chess activity, which is a data science program, mm-hmm. which will start this next uh, next month. And it will end in July. And I plan to, after that, uh, travel a little bit because I'm not used to just being home. And I've been home for over a year. I mean, since Rilton Cup, I haven't been anywhere. Oh, yeah. So Same, same here. <laughs> yeah. So since Wilton Cup, I haven't been anywhere, and it's just too much for me. And yeah. uh, like in seventeen, I I was I won the U.S. Grand Prix. Like there's a there's a tour of tournaments, and then you you accumulate points, and then you win the prize money. I had sixty flights in two thousand seventeen. Wow. Sixty. So, uh, yeah, it, I don't want to get back on the road like that. I want to pay attention to my health, of course, but I really miss traveling. I would like to visit Europe. Probably, I might come to Hamburg actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vienna. My sister lives in Vienna, Austria. Uh, I would like to visit uh, Portugal. These are the three places I want to go. And I haven't spent time in London, but I don't know how are things with the, you know, the new COVID thing they had, and if traveling to London would be easy. But if I get my shot, Europe is somewhere I want to visit if I can in summer. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. We hope to see you in Europe then. And uh, who knows? Maybe we will meet some someday somewhere at a chess tournament, for for example. <laughs> I would love to. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, I would love to. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It was a Absolutely. very uh, a, a great uh, talking to you. And uh, I hope the listeners also enjoyed it. I hope so too. I, I touched a few maybe uh, topics that may be a little bit controversial, but I hope that people understand it was just my experience. No, nothing, nothing personal on there. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thanks again and uh, all the best to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank thank you very much. Dear listeners, I hope you enjoyed this interesting conversation about chess with Elshan Moradi Abadi. I will put up a link to the publisher Thinkers Publishing in the description of the episode if you want to find out more about Sherlock's method. Subscribe to the podcast if you want to hear more conversations with people from the world of chess. And if you want to become a better chess player, I would like to recommend the Master Classes by World Chess. The next Master Class session will be with Grandmaster Veselin Topalov and you can get a discount by using the code LTAC10 to get a 10% discount on this Master Class. My name is Erik van Rehm. I will be back soon with another episode of Let's Talk About Chess. Stay healthy and keep on playing. <laughs>